Just let me know when it's gone live. Hi, guys. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, just wanted to thank everybody for turning up tonight. It should be an interesting uh, group of topics. We thought we'd go something different. We have done abdominal surgery. We've done all kinds of orthopedic surgeries. And so thought, we thought that this would be a little bit different. Um, speaking tonight first is Dr. Alex Santa Maria, who's been at South Pause for about seven years now, um, not including the amount of time that she spent with us as a student. And so she did her uh, oncology internship with us and then stayed on and did a surgical residency and then um, has been a staff surgeon ever since and is sitting her exams this February for the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. And um, hopefully we'll have another surgeon on staff after that. So um, Alex uh, has... Um, interest in all kinds of surgery, but uh, probably tending a little bit more toward the soft tissue side. Um, and um, so we're really grateful to have her working with us. And I'm sure that you guys have had an opportunity to speak with her as well. Um, I recognize almost everybody here. Um, and so that's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces. So we are live streaming tonight. Um, and so that's on YouTube. And so if you um, are interested later to go back and review, or if anybody that you know would like to go and review the or, or view the lecture that uh, we've put on tonight, um, it's just on our YouTube channel, which is South Paws Vet. Is everybody already a, a subscriber? Everybody know about our YouTube channel? Um, if you have any questions about that, let us know in the break, and um, we can um, help you get set up. So I'm going to leave it to Alex, and uh, and then I'll come on in a, in a little bit. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Charles. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to be chatting tonight about um, pericardial effusions in particular and then a little bit about chylothorax as well. Um, if I start to talk really fast, it's because I'm very nervous and I apologize. So just tell me to slow down. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, let me know. And hopefully it's not too basic for you guys, but I am going to go through a little bit to do with kind of the workup um, presentation of pericardial effusions and chylothorax, as well as some of our surgical management of it and the outcomes of it. So when you are talking with your clients, you can give them really good ideas on outcomes of these sorts of conditions. So just to start, um, I always like to start with a little bit of anatomy with the pericardium also because it does influence which way we go by way of surgical side of things and outcomes. We'll remember that the pericardium has two layers to it. It has a fibrous outer layer to it and then an inner serosal sort of layer that's stuck onto the heart. And when we do end up with sort of um, conditions with fibrosis, we can end up with problems with that serous layer that are not really fixable with anything surgical. They can be managed slightly with medical management, but it's a really guarded prognosis when we start to get a problem with those. The other thing that we know is that the functions of the pericardium, it maintains the heart in the middle of the chest as much as it can. That's via those sternal and diaphragmatic structures that retains, um, restrains sorry, cardiac filling, um, and that helps to keep the heart from becoming really over distended and allows that balance of output of blood. It protects against atrial rupture when we've got really bad mitral valve insufficiency or myocardial hemorrhage when we possibly have a tumour present in that area. It ha can help to decrease the spread of infections and it can provide a gliding surface to accommodate heart motion within the chest. Normally, the amount of pericardial fluid does depend on the size of the dog, um, and it can range anywhere between 1 to 15 mils, and it is an ultrafiltrate of serum. So why is pericardial effusion really bad? And the main reason is because of cardiac tamponade, and that is a combination of a reduction of your cardiac output and an increase in your systemic venous pressure. What the volume of fluid is too much? I often hear that from a couple of people and, you know, it really depends on the size of the animal, but more importantly on how quickly this fluid's actually developed. We can have dogs have 500 mils to one litre worth of fluid coming off the, the pericardium and they are sitting up looking at you wagging their tail, whereas other dogs it can be 200 mils and they are dying essentially. And that really depends on the compliance of the pericardium. So if this fluid does develop quite slowly, it gives the pericardium time to be able to dilate so you can have much larger volumes of fluid before you get an increase in intracardial pressure. Whereas if it happens really acutely with a really acute bleed, then that intracardial pressure goes up really quickly. So the things that are involved that sort of set off everything else is that when you get an increase in that pericardial pressure, that leads to an increase in your diastolic pressure within your heart 
which decreases your stroke volume. So you're getting less and less blood going out. In turn, you get a stimulation of a couple of things. You get activation of your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, which conserves your sodium, therefore conserves your water, which increases your blood volume. At the same time, you get a large amount of catecholamine release, which is a positive ionotropic and coronotropic effects, and it causes vasoconstriction. <laughs> In those instances, in the nor sorry, in normal instances when these things go off, the increase in blood volume back to the heart causes dilation of your atrium, which leads to a release in your ANP, which can turn off your RAS system. But because you've got cardiac tamponade from the outside, that dilation doesn't actually happen and you get continued activation of your RAS system, continued conservation of your sodium and your water to try and preserve that blood volume. And then you get venous distension secondarily to that. So etiology of pericardial effusion, it really does depend on what kind of fluid you get off from the, the pericardium when you do take a sample. So your transudates can happen in congestive heart failure, peritoneal pericardial diaphragmatic hernias, hypoalbuminemia or increased vascular permeability. With exudates, you're usually talking about infectious things, bacterial, fungal, or viral infections. Sometimes you can have non-infectious pericarditis that does come off as an exudate as well. And then hemorrhagic from things like trauma, neoplasia, rat bait, or rupture of your left atrium, secondary to mitral valve disease. Um, idiopathic uh, hemorrhagic pericarditis is the most common cause of a hemorrhagic pericarditis, right? So neoplasia is the second and they're always on the top when we've got any sort of pericardial effusion whether it's the idiopathic or a neoplasia and we always talk to owners about both. So signalment of pericardial hemorrhage, um, they're often your older larger breed dogs, golden retrievers are overrepresented in this group. In the presentation your acute pericardial effusions will be acutely hypotensive their rapidly progressive weakness, dyspnea, collapse, and cardiogenic shock. The more chronic ones, you'll really hear that muffled heart sound. You might have weak femoral pulses, tachycardia, and you can sometimes see distension of your jugular veins and your peripheral veins. So diagnosis, um, clinical exam is obviously really important. ECG, you can see alterations of your waveform. So this sort of peak is changing its position on the graph. And that's actually due to the heart swinging within the fluid and getting more and more electrical on the one side compared to the other one. Radiographs are your sort of routine one where you see that globoid shape of your heart um, and it sort of is really, really enlarged within your thoracic cavity. And then on echo, as we would probably have seen previously, you can see an anechoic space between your epipericardium and your pericardial sac. We really encourage our interns when they first come in to put the ultrasound probe on hearts when they have a spare time to have a little bit of a look. It is really easy to see if you have an ultrasound probe. So definitely try it out if you haven't done it in a while. Um, it's like it's a very nice sort of halo that you can see around them. Sorry. So short-term sort of treatments, um, pericardiocentesis. So ideally going through the fifth and sixth intercostal space on the right-hand side. There are many, many ways to do this. I've seen six or seven different ways just within our practice on how different people do it. You can use an over-needle catheter, a spinal needle, another long rigid sort of needle. Um, my preference is to use an 18 gauge over the needle catheter and that's because Richard Woolley was around one day watching me try to do it with a different sort of technique and said, hell no, don't do that, you do this now. And what we do is that obviously we clip over the site, we put in a local block all the way down through um, into the intercostal muscles because that'll be the point where they jump, go straight in with ultrasound guidance with the stylet in place until you get blood back, take that off and then connect up your three-way stopcock and your extension set. I like to have two needles, uh, two sorry syringes connected to my three-way stopcock. So then that way I can take one out with five mil syringe, give that to the nurse to put into either a serum or a plain tube. So we've got our samples and then the other one can just be draining while we do that. 
I have also seen people attach suction tubes onto the end of these so it sort of sucks all the fluid out really, really quickly. Um, that's a really good way to get rid of it quite quickly. The other way um, that sort of Richard had mentioned is doing like a Z pattern. So once you get in, then moving your catheter in a Z manner to actually cut through the pericardium to open the fluid into the pleural cavity. That scares me a little bit too much. So I like to just go straight in and then drain it, but you can do that as well. Long-term treatment, then we are talking about things like pericardectomy, um, and you can do that in an open manner or a thoracoscopic manner. Um, and you can do either a total pericardectomy or a subphrenic um, pericardectomy, and we will go through that. They also used to talk quite a bit about thoracoscopic pericardial window or just doing a pericardial window, which is a smaller sort of opening, usually around about three centimetres by three centimetres. Um, we've pretty much stopped doing that based on this paper in 2013, which looked at um, median survival times of dogs with um, idiopathic and neoplastic pericardial effusions. And they looked at the median survival time and the disease-free interval with just doing a pericardial window versus doing a subphrenic pericardectomy and found that the median survival time and the disease-free intervals were a lot shorter if you only did a pericardial window. And they were actually finding that the pericardium was attaching onto the heart and then reforming that effusion and then owners were electing to euthanize because of recurrence of clinical signs, which wasn't as common when you did the subphrenic pericardectomy. Now, by way of doing the pericardectomies, um, like we said, you can do them open or thoracoscopically, sorry. I've got a video of both. Um, so I, I guess more originally we would have done, except now it's not gonna play, sorry. Yeah, and um, this is a, a video from a little while ago that is on our Southpaws YouTube channel um, of an open pericardectomy. So we are splitting the sternum in this instance and placing Finichetto retractors in there to be able to open that out. When you do split the sternum, you want to leave either the manubrium or the xiphoid intact for closure because they need some stability with that. The um, oscillating saw that we're using in that instance, we are actually able to place something underneath it, usually a freer elevator so that then we know when we go down, we're not gonna hit the heart. Obviously, when you go through the sternum, the heart is directly under there, which makes it a bit easier for you. We do relieve the attachments from the sternum, so that sternopericardial ligament, and that allows us to get a bit more movement of the heart afterwards so we can in inspect for other issues. We do use a combination of electrocautery, um, even that close to the heart. Usually we like to use the bipolar cautery, but you can use monopolar as long as you're very careful, obviously not to touch the heart, it doesn't like that. Um, and then dissecting down so we can completely see that pericardium. And we inspect the whole pericardium from the outside to make sure we don't have any signs of any sort of cancer that might be present there that wasn't picked up in our initial examinations. Now, the next step is obviously grabbing onto or grasping onto the pericardium. Um, so I'll just fast forward a tiny bit if that's okay. So we're using um, DeBakey forceps to elevate it and fairly similar to like when you stab in through the linear elba, you just make a tiny little nick in the pericardium with your Metzenbaum scissors and then sort of enlarge it either again with um, the Metzenbaums or you can use the electric order at that time. Then here they're placing a pool suction tip into there to try and relieve that pressure of any fluid present. You can be a little bit rough with the heart in that area. Obviously try to be quite careful, but advise your nurse or whoever's looking at the ECG that it's going to go wild. The heart doesn't like to be touched. As long as you sort of only touch it very briefly, it should be okay. And then going and removing the pericardium, just ventral to your phrenic nerves on both sides. You really need to preserve those phrenic nerves. They do talk about you being able to sacrifice one on one side, but you will get problems with your diaphragm not contracting appropriately when you do do that. Definitely, yeah. definitely. So we want to get them as stable as possible before then taking them to surgery. Absolutely. So the other way is to do it thoracoscopically. Um, and this is Oh, I've got Charlesy talking here, sorry. Again, this is also on our um, YouTube channel. Um, so when we actually do go in, we go in through just sort of sub xiphoid with our camera. We want to do a full examination of the whole pleural cavity. This is actually using our 3D um, sort of viewing, which is, is very, very cool. And it gives you a really good depth possession, um, sorry, perception as you're going in. 
Now, what we've done here is we've actually gone through and made a hole through our mediastinum from the left-hand side through to the right side um, to allow us to be able to dissect off those sternal attachments um, through the mediastinum and allowing us to get visualisation. And we can see the internal thoracic artery is up the top there, that kind of bluish thing at the very top. We obviously want to stay away from that. That's really important to try and maintain that and it will bleed profusely if you touch it too much. So by dissecting down, then we can get down and grasp onto the pericardium with forceps. And again, it's the same sort of manner as an open, you make a small nick in the pericardium, the fluid itself will start to drain out and then you remove the pericardium um, uh, underneath the phrenic nerves as well. You can see once we go back onto the view of that pericardium, it's very thick. It should be a really thin, almost see-through um, piece of tissue. Um, if it's not diseased. So we can tell already that that one's quite thickened. Now, when we're talking about kind of outcomes, there are a couple of papers that have come out recently. The one on the left is from 2018 in Vet Surge, and they talked about 18 dogs. Um, and basically what they looked at was all these dogs failed to show any signs of any tumours on echo, on CT scan, prior to going to surgery. Then they went in and then they looked at the heart with a small camera inside the chest um, and they found that nine out of 18 of those dogs actually had changes either in their pericardium or on their heart. And that really significantly decreased their survival post pericardectomy. So when changes were present, the median survival time was only 66 days post surgery, where if the changes weren't present, they actually didn't reach their median survival time. So the study ended at five years and those dogs were alive. So I guess when we're talking to owners, although we can't see anything on echo or CT, et cetera, we always do warn that until you send that pericardium away and you have a really good look at the whole heart, we still can't rule out a cancerous sort of situation. On the right hand side there, there's a um, 2019 paper that looked at um, the 16 dogs with recurrence of uh, pericardial fluid after one or multiple pericardiocentesis. Their median survival time after surgery was about a year. Um, they did diagnose neoplasia in eight of those 16 dogs. So I think it is a little bit more common. I know we talk about idiopathic being the most common, but a lot of the papers are saying that it is increasing um, whether or not we're seeing it more um, and the papers are more coming out about that. So things to consider with your idiopathic pericardial um, effusions, neoplasia, as we talked about. So chemodectomas can have a really good outcome with surgery. It depends on how big they are and what they are wrapped around. Hemangiosarcoma, as we know, does not, but you can do pericardectomies to give them that period of time usually about a month after the procedure before they have another big bleed. And sometimes that's all owners want, as long as you're upfront with them to start with, that that's the case. The other thing is the constrictive pericarditis. Now that's that thing that I was talking about when the serous sort of covering of the pericardium, that inner layer actually becomes really firmly adherent to the heart. And we've had one case of that in the last seven years that I've been there and you could feel it in surgery. The heart just couldn't beat as appropriately as it should, but you don't know that until pretty much you go in. You can measure the cardiac pressures, but then the cardiologists say if you've got cardiac tamponade at the same time, how do you know if it's a tamponade or actually the restrictive pericarditis? And it is very difficult. These dogs continue to effuse in their abdomen due to increased pressure, and it can be really difficult to deal with. Um, so they're just a couple of things to have on your radar. So then if we talk about chylothorax, um, there are numerous causes of chylothorax, cardiomyopathy, mediastinal masses, heartworm, lung lobe torsion, heart-based masses, iatrogenic damage to your thoracic duct, any penetrating trauma that affects your thoracic duct. The most common cause, however, is also idiopathic and it's associated with inflammation of your lymphatic system. There are some predispositions and breeds wise, um, Afghan hounds, although I've never seen one have a um, chylothorax in our clinic, oriental cats are the more common of the cat breeds to, to get that issue. Clinical signs, I'm sure you've probably seen this when the owners come in at five o'clock on a Friday that the cat's been breathing funny for multiple days and you see this and it, you know, you freak out because it's about to die. Anything similar to a pleural effusion, so tachypnea, increased respiratory effort, shallow respiration, restricted breathing, lethargy, cough, possibly cyanosis and collapse. 
in the more chronic forms, you get more like this dog down the bottom where they have really poor body condition um, and a really dull sort of coat. They just tend to sort of smolder along and you can have intermittent pyrexic episodes with it. If there's um, concurrent pericardial effusion, um, then you might start to notice that dilation of your jugular veins and the venous distension from the cardiac tamponade as well. Um, so diagnostics, full bloods, possibly urinalysis, but you often don't see any changes associated with that. Sometimes you can see a bit of an inflammatory leukogram. Radiographs, they need to be taken on peak inspiration and they should be centred over the heart so that your thoracic inlet and your caudal dorsal lung lobes are all obtained in the same radiograph. That can be really difficult with your Great Danes. Sometimes you do have to take them in two views. The features are your loss of your cardiac silhouette, um, the loss of the diaphragmatic silhouette, retraction of your lung lobes and that visualisation of the lung lobe fissures. It's much easier with CT. We're very, very spoiled. On the right, uh, left hand, no, right hand side for you guys, sorry, there's a CT scan which the purple arrow is pointing towards our pleural effusion. It is actually dependent. This CT is done with the dog on its back. I've just rotated around because you're supposed to look at it this way. The orange arrow is pointing towards our normal lung lobes and the yellow arrow is actually pointing towards a pneumothorax. So we can determine all sort of three of those things very, very easily with CT scan but you can't necessarily do that awake. Sometimes you can do it when these dogs are this sick, um, but often you can't really anesthetize them for it. Um, just one quick question to that. Um, can you use the pointer? Mm. So just because the colors of the arrows are mm. distorted. So that's the fluid up in that sort of dorsal aspect of the thoracic cavity. Um, over here is your normal lung lobe. It's also up here. This is your, peri uh, your heart over this area here, and then your pneumothorax down in that ventral portion there. Um, so your workup, the thoracocentesis is part of the workup and it's done very similarly to your pericardiocentesis, except obviously you don't go as deep. We still do that local nerve block, go in sort of 90 degrees initially until you get through your intercostal muscles and then redirect your needle down so that it's running um, along that inside part of the wall and you want that bevel against the wall so that sharp point's not heading towards your lungs. Again, I like to have the three-way stopcock the extension set somebody there taking the fluid out very similarly to your pericardiocentesis um, so then that way we can drain it appropriately and you want to drain until you don't get any more fluid and that may involve moving the dog around or cat around so that then they are sort of turning over side to side to allow you to drain both sides sometimes your mediastinum is still intact and you'll have to tap the other side as well Ideally, we start out with the right side of the chest, especially if more fluids on that side. You want to go the ventral one third and ideally around about the seventh intercostal space. Fluid analysis. So Kyle is a modified transudate. Its protein um, concentration is greater than 2.5 grams per deciliter and it usually has a nucleated cell count between 6,000 to 7,000. When you want to look at the fluid, you need to compare um, the triglyceride and the cholesterol levels with normal serum um, and your triglyceride levels will be increased and your cholesterol levels will be decreased in your pleural fluid in comparison to your serum. The other um, better thought of sort of testing to do is actually to stain for chylomicrons and they do that at the test where they stain for the Sudan black and they come out as really pretty little black dots um, sitting in them. Um, if once you drain the chest, it starts to build up too quickly, you may have to consider putting in a drain overnight until you can get those results back from the labs because it is going to take 24 hours. Although, to be honest, most of the time you take Kyle out and you look at it and you're like, that's Kyle. We just send it off to get complete com confirmation. So treatment options for your idiopathic um, uh, chylothorax. There are lots. Um, there are combinations of thoracic duct ligation, thoracic duct embolization, pericardectomy, cisterna chile ablation, or a combination of that surgery. And dependent on who you talk to, lots of people have lots of different views on there. And there is a lot of information out there in papers. And pretty much no one has settled on what the best treatment is for this condition. So usually... 99% of people do thoracic duct ligation. 
So the thoracic duct, you'll remember, drains all the lymph from the abdomen into the cisterna chile. Then it goes across the diaphragm through the aortic hiatus. It can split into multiple sort of um, branches and then comes together again to go into your left external jugular vein. There is a species difference. So dogs, it's on the right-hand side of the chest and cats, it's on the left-hand side of the chest. And there is also individuality within that. So some dogs will have four or five branches, one, some will have one branch. So we often do a thing called lymph, um, lymphangiography um, to have a little bit of a look at that. And you can do that with X-ray or with CT scan. And what you do is that you usually choose a peripheral lymph node. The popliteal one's quite good. Either looking at it, either grabbing onto it, looking at it with ultrasound or making a small incision over it and injecting contrast into that. If you wait 15 minutes, this thing lights up because it drains all the way through. So you can see in your thoracic x-ray here, you can follow that through to see your main sort of branch there. CT scan gives you a bit more of a 3D view and it can give you an idea of how many branches there are. So when we are going in to try and ligate these, we have a better idea and to be able to manage it rather than leaving a branch and accidentally getting some more leakage. Um, Intraoperatively, so if you are going in, you can do an intercostal approach into the chest, usually through the, the 10th intercostal um, site. You can do a paracostal approach, which is more what we generally tend to do when we're going after these guys in an open manner, where we make an incision along the 13th rib, go into the abdomen, take down the diaphragm, and then you're right there because you want to be able to ligate this just cranial to the diaphragm because that's going to be where less of your branches are. So one of the ways that we can sort of have a little bit of a look at it intra-op is you can inject methylene blue into just any lymph node in the abdomen and it will flow up and light up. So up here, we've got the aorta down here. The thoracic duct is coming along here in a very bright blue manner. And then you've got the ozygous and then it's associated branches above that. And that will stay for about two hours after you inject the methylene blue in. And it's a very small amount. It's like 0.1 mils of methylene blue and it'll light up for you to be able to view that. Um, you can also, there's a group I think in Italy that are doing these thoracoscopically as well and they actually do it with two um, cameras, one looking from each side. They dissect down using electric cautery within their thoracoscopic equipment um, right next to the aorta. So the aorta is actually up here um, very, very close and very scary for my liking. Um, and they dissect up over the top of it to, to be able to get their suture in. Then they continue to dissect um, to get to the point where the ozygous is and they actually ligate everything within that. And there can be fat as well as your thoracic ducts and they actually find that they get all those other little branches as well. But by having the camera in both sides, they can view multiple branches from different directions. And they are in this one doing it, I'll show you with a suture or two sutures. There, so they're tying it off and then actually cutting through it. There are reports in using hemoclips, but they don't recommend it in cats because for some reason cats can recannulize when you do that. So they really recommend ligating these with suture instead of with um, hemoclips. Cisterna chile ablation. So the cisterna chile is the collection of those lymphatic ducts and it actually sits um, medial to the hilus of the left kidney. It's very hard to see when it's not illuminated by something. It's basically like a clear sort of sac. So you, with that methylene blue, you can see it. So up here, this is what all of this is here. And then heading to the thoracic duct cranially towards the chest. So obviously, if you are going to use the methylene blue technique, you would do your thoracic duct ligation first and then do your cisterna chile ablation. Otherwise, the dye will come out of your thoracic duct going into your chest and you won't be able to see it anymore. And basically, you stick some mets and balm scissors in there and break it open slowly. And then all the blue dye will start to go through the abdomen, which is the chyle draining into the abdomen. That chyle then starts to just go back into different other lymphatic areas and get drained appropriately back through the body. 
pericardectomy. So it was initially used as a salvage procedure, but people are now using it more as part of the primary procedure. It's fairly similar to what we've talked about previously. The reason that they think pericardectomy helps is if the pericardium is causing any constriction of that draining of the, into, of the thoracic duct into the heart, by removing the pericardium, you can remove that sort of restriction. Um, in general, they recommend aiming for that subtotal um, pericardectomy as opposed to anything to do with your pericardial window. And you can obviously do that as we've talked about open or thoracoscopically or paracostally. Post-surgery, these guys need about two weeks worth of exercise restriction. If we do go in open and split the sternum, we usually recommend somewhere between two to four weeks. They have these thoracic drains placed, and you can see that one heading into there, for somewhere between one to three days. These guys will often put a lot of fluid into their chest, and it changes from the chyle fluid to just a clear fluid. Um, after 24 hours, it usually goes up quite high, and then it starts to decrease in volume after that. If you've still got a fusion after three days, you need to think about putting a different type of um, drainage tube in, ideally sub, something subcutaneously that isn't going to get infected that can stay in there a bit more long term. Pain relief wise, we use opioids, we use combinations of like fentanyl, ketamine, lignocaine, depending on what the animal needs. I've had one Labrador that needed absolutely no opioids or he would go off his chop. He just had non-steroidals and he was fine with his sternotomy with a local block every six hours with that. IV fluids, you do need to match these guys' ins and outs. So usually we do place a urinary catheter into them so we can monitor the amount of fluid coming out because you will get a lot of fluid off that chest and it has a lot of protein in it as well. So you need to be feeding them appropriately with a high protein diet. After the three to four days, if we're still not getting any resolution, then we always place a pleural port. And I've got a picture of that a bit later for you guys to, to sort of discuss that through. Outcomes, if you look in the textbook, you are dealing with, with just doing your thoracic duct ligation. Only about 60% of dogs will get complete resolution of this condition and 53% of cats at best. With thoracic duct ligation and subphrenic pericardectomy, somewhere between 55 to 100% of dogs, depending on what study you look at, and about 80% of cats. And if you do the thoracic duct and the cisterna chyle ablation up to sort of 88% in both cats and dogs. I could not find a paper that looked at kind of all three in big numbers doing the pericardectomy, the cisterna chyle and the thoracic duct ablation. They're all quite, uh, thoracic duct ligation, sorry. They're all kind of smaller studies that I could find and, and not a lot of them have a good sort of control group associated with them. This one, so this one was done in 2018. It looked at 22 cats treated with thoracic duct ligation and pericardectomy versus the thoracic duct ligation, pericardectomy and cisterna chyle ablation. And basically five out of 25 of the cats had persistent effusion four weeks post-surgery and it was about 50% in each sort of group. What they worked out was that recurrence happened in two cats, one in each of the two groups, um, but the median survival time was also not statistically different between the two groups, but these are quite low numbers when you're comparing them. They did obviously report that the surgery time to do the thoracic duct ligation, the cisterna chyle ablation and the pericardectomy was longer than not doing that and then doing the other two procedures. Mayhew released a paper this year um, on 39 dogs with chylothorax um, treated thoracoscopically with thoracic duct ligation and pericardectomy. Um, and they found that um, two dogs died interoperatively. One actually had the restrictive pleuritis when they went in and, and died on the table. One of them did have a cardiac arrest that they weren't able to get back. They had to convert 3% um, of dogs for the thoracic ligation, uh, thoracic duct ligation, sorry, and 11% when they were doing the pericardectomy, but they had resolution of the pleural effusion in 95% of dogs by doing those two procedures. They did report late recurrence of the effusion in three dogs, so 9% of dogs. So when we are doing these procedures, we also do try and do medical management at the same time. So using some sort of low fat diet to try and decrease the amount of fat that's present within the system. 
and then using the nutraceutical rutin. It's not proven. Um, however, it is thought to decrease um, lymphatic leakage. There's no paper out there that shows that it is effective for what particular reason, but we have used it in cases where we've had continued effusion and found it to be effective. doesn't have any side effects except some dogs are on 15 tablets a couple of times a day and that can get pretty labour intensive for the owners. Complications, like we said, the persistent chylothorax, um, the persistent non chylous pleural effusion, lung lobe torsion because of the mobility of being in fluid itself, pneumothorax often from misuse of drains um, or damage to the lung lobes when you are in surgery, the fibrosing pleuritis because the lungs do not like to be sitting in a large volume of fluid and do get irritated, particularly with chylus fluid, and pyothorax um, with risk of in, you know, introducing an infection from us or from the body um, with systemic infections. One of our sort of saving graces are these pleuroports. I don't know if anyone's had a lot to do with them, but they're pretty neat. They're little subcutaneous ports that go underneath the skin into the chest and then are closed over. So there's nothing externally that the dogs can pull out. Um, they seem to be relatively well tolerated. A paper came out last year that showed that they can stay patent in dogs for up to five to seven years after placement. To be able to tap into these, so it's open surgical approach to put them in. Um, in that bottom left-hand corner, you can see this pleuroport, which is made up of a silicone plug um, and a stainless steel sort of button, and then the tube goes into the chest. When you are using them, they do recommend putting either a local anaesthetic cream on, like an Emla cream on the site, because repeated um, penetration into it can be a bit uncomfortable for them. You use a specific type of needle called a Hubert needle, which does not take a core out of the center of the pleura port each time you enter it. By just pushing it directly straight into the port, then you can drain it. It's the similar system when you're talking about the subs with urethral, uh, ureteral blockages, et cetera. Um, it's the same sort of port that you tend to use. Um, so we have had to put this in a couple of dogs when they had longer sort of effusions within their chest and the owners were actually able to be taught to use these at home to be able to drain the chest. Does anyone have any questions? Correct, and we dilute it 50-50 with saline. It's usually only about, like we usually do a one-to-one -one ratio, so two mils and two mils, and we usually only have to inject about a mil, depends on the size of the dog, because these are usually larger breed dogs, it's usually about a mil to a mil and a half um, of that diluted fluid. In the smaller dogs, I would start with half a mil and then check, check to an x-ray in 15 minutes and see if we've got a, a visualisation of it. I do one just one yeah and then that just gives you the second one so if the first one doesn't work then you've got that option of doing the second one yeah oh good <laughs> my preference like from what I've read I think if you're in there and everything's open you may like if, I like to do the paracostal approach because I can see everything um, I like to do all three sort of procedures at once and then sometimes it, dependent on the owner's finances if we've only got one go at this and they're not going to be able to afford anything going further I'll put a pleuroport in as a safety measure so then it's sitting underneath the skin we may never use it but then it's at least there um, I know that James particularly likes to do the thoracic duct ligation and then the cisterna chile ablation and has the pericardiectomy as a backup if he needs to at a later point but there's just no consensus in the surgery world yet of which is the best way to go Thanks, guys. Um, and we were always kind of of the belief as well that if you, like if you have a persistent one after surgery or even instead of surgery, if you manage them medically for um, several months, often they will resolve on their own. And so the surgery is for the acute problem, but sometimes after six months or a year um, of Pull report or continue drainage that the um, the chylothorax will resolve. Um, I think that's it there. Open that with. Do you have numbers on your? Okay, we may have to switch. I know that's good. Yeah. 
Are you going to be able to view it through the window? Oh, that's on preview. Yeah. Um, hold on just a second. Do you have, uh, we might do it on Alex's. Sorry, Keynote. Do you have Keynote on yours? Um, see if you can airdrop. Sorry, be just a second. Um, just see how you go, and I'll try to airdrop it to Alex. I think you just unplugged something. Um, I'm sending that across to you now, Alex. Hold on just a second. Hey. Uh, this is it. On, so this is the last lecture. Um, if you can, because I'm not sure if Alex's computer. Oh, that seems. Are you plugged in now, Alex? Is that you? Okay. All right. Sorry, just a second, guys. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. Okay. Uh, so where would that be? Just go up to the top, first slide, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, I'm going to take uh, an opportunity to discuss thoracic trauma in dogs and cats. And it's something that um, certainly emergency centers see with some frequently, but I, frequency, but I imagine that in primary care practice you would see it as well. Uh, and we talk about different types of thoracic trauma. Most commonly probably would be road, uh, road traffic trauma, and then bite wounds would be the other most common thing that we see. So. Um, Actually, the most common trauma that, that we see is surgical trauma. And so this would be removing um, or doing a rib resection for um, a rib mass. And um, what's interesting, you guys will out flail chests, right, in school. I actually don't really believe that flail chest exists in dogs. And the reason why that is is that I can create huge chest wall defects. And if I cover them with just skin and muscle, we don't have any respiratory problems. And so what's probably going on is actually pulmonary contusions along with the flail chest, and that's what causes the respiratory embarrassment. So um, <laughs> we, uh, I always love to see the brachycephalic dogs that after you do um, surgery on them and you put the endotracheal tube in, and I've actually seen brachycephalic dogs going for a walk outside with an endotracheal tube in. So they're just so... Um, uh, really, so you'll find that pugs after uh, brachycephalic airway surgery actually become as intelligent as. So um, I'm going to do about um, some imaging related to uh, thoracic trauma, bite wounds, and then some other diagnoses. I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, triage and stabilization because it's beyond the scope of this um, this lecture. And here we have a penetrating cardiac wound. So this would have been similar to what Steve Irwin would have had when he got um, the, the stingray to the heart. And this was very commonly seen in humans um, during wartime. The first time that cardiac 
wound, penetrating wounds were repaired were probably in the Civil War in the 1800 and, 1865 kind of uh, era where they actually were successfully able to repair these. Um, as far as thoracic imaging is concerned, the things that we think about for trauma cases would be radiographs, CT scan, and ultrasound, and their advantages and disadvantages to each one. So thoracic radiography obviously is um, inexpensive and widely available. Um, advantages are that it's highly diagnostic for things like pneumo and hydrothorax, different types of fractures, hernias, pulmonary contusions, and things like that. And that would be our standard go-to um, initially when we're um, uh, in most places anyway, when we're, when we're dealing with thoracic trauma. Uh, the downside is um, not, uh, not a significant issue would be radiation exposure to patient and staff. And it's not a huge issue, but it's something that we need to be aware of. Um, it can be stressful to the patient as well as to the staff. And some patients will require sedation. And if you have a patient that is in respiratory compromise, is that really the one that you want to sedate? Um, you have to move them from ICU to the to the um, radio or the radiology suite or out of their cage or whatever, and uh, you really need to delay it until a patient is stable. And so you don't want to take a cat that's in respiratory distress, open mouth mouth breathing. You haven't resolved the primary problem. Then you take them to X-ray and you can really push them over the edge um, to respiratory arrest. Um, mobile X-ray is is really nice. Uh, so we can do cage side X-rays in our hospital. You can get um, secondhand uh, mobile x-ray units for kind of in the range of five to $6,000, um, sometimes on eBay, sometimes through some of the um, other uh, secondhand equipment distributors. And we really like our mobile x-ray because we'll take x-rays right in the surgery suite, for example, or we can take it out to ICU. The other nice thing is that you can take x-rays on the floor in big dogs. And so you don't have to stress them to pick them up and put them on the table. So that's really handy. This is not exactly our unit, but we, uh, a lot of big dogs, we'll just have them lightly sedated and laying out on the floor. And then you can take the x-ray right where they are, take the radiograph right where they are. And so they don't get anywhere near as stressed. Uh, as far as CT scan is concerned, it's amazing imaging uh, for things like fractures, contusions, hydrohemothorax, pericardial effusion, hernias. And it would be kind of the the standard of care or state of the art when it comes to thoracic imaging, much better than MRI. Um, problem with taking thoracic radiographs with MRI is that any movement is going to cause a huge artifact, whereas with CT, especially with one of our multi-slice scanners, 16 or 32 slice scanners, um, movement artifact is not really a big deal. Um, so this is just a patient that has extensive pulmonary contusions. Um, this is not a dog. This is a human patient after a road uh, traffic accident. And you can see all of this, um, I'm not getting, let's see. Um, anyway, so you can see all of this parenchymal uh, disease, which is due basically to hemorrhage within the alveoli. Um, this is another human patient. And what we can see on top of the screen is the heart being pushed up. And what we can see in the middle of the screen is the stomach. Okay, and so you can see the fundus of the stomach over here and then the pylorus right in the middle, right underneath the vertebral body. And so this is very clearly a diaphragmatic hernia. Um, so disadvantages of CT scan would be that it's expensive and not widely available. So most referral centers have a CT scan. I would say probably most emergency hospitals in Melbourne that don't have a referral center attached to them don't have CT. Um, it is stressful to the patient and often it requires a general anesthetic. If you have a really moribund patient, then you can do a CT without sedation, but that's not our typical road traffic trauma. If you have a patient that's moribund after road traffic trauma or a bite wound, that is a sick and nearly dead dog um, or cat. And so if we have patients that have either abdominal form bodies or are really metabolically deranged, then we can do awake CT scans, but that's not gonna be the case with, um, with road traffic trauma or bite wounds. And so generally those patients are gonna have to require a general, or have a general anesthetic. Um, there is a minor issue of radiation exposure to the staff and the patient. And in most cases, the patient is gonna be in a closed lead room and we're gonna be watching them either through leaded glass or with, um, with a camera. And the other issue, just like with x-ray, is that in most cases, the patient has to be moved from the ICU 
um, and the, the cage or the oxygen cage into the uh, CT suite. So um, there is an, another form of assessment, which is called um, uh, FAST, which is focused assessment with sonography, sonography for trauma. How many of you are familiar with FASTVET or FAST? So there's a vet who is an intern the year behind me at Animal Medical Center named Greg Lissandra, who started this company called, Fat, called FASTVET. And they just go around the world training people in, um, in fast ultrasound. And um, it's kind of uh, the standard of care in humans where I talk to a friend of mine who's a critical care specialist in a, at the Alfred. They don't even wear a stethoscope anymore. They just carry around an ultrasound, literally on a little stick, ultrasound bedside. And that's going to give you a lot more information than, uh, than a stethoscope is going to. So it's interesting to see how things have gone in, um, uh, in human medicine. So AFAST is, is looking at the abdomen. Um, so up here, the DH is diaphragmatic hernia. Um, uh, the CC, I believe, is looking for bladder rupture. I'm not, I, and I haven't taken this, um, this course, but we're looking at the four quadrants of the abdomen, um, looking for hemorrhage, diaphragmatic hernia, um, ruptured bladder, and things like that, and uh, retroperitoneal hemorrhage and fluid and that sort of thing. TFAST is going to be looking for uh, diaphragmatic hernias. You can look at the parenchyma of the lung. I always was taught that ultrasound is not good at looking at lung because of the air spaces, but you can actually look at whether the lung has contusions, whether it's surrounded by fluid, whether there's a pneumothorax, um, all those things, as well as pericardial effusion. Um, so it's a really, really helpful thing. And if you guys are interested in that, look up um, fastvet.com and you can do actually online courses as well as doing the courses in person. So advantages of ultrasound, it's uh, very fast and you can assess pneumo and hydrothorax, hernias, fractures even. You, so who, who would have thought that you could diagnose a fracture using an ultrasound and you can also see uh, plur, or, um, pulmonary contusions. So this uh, uh, image here so shows just um, uh, free abdominal fluid uh, inside the abdomen. So again, it is the standard of care in human medicine. Um, the patient does not have to be moved in the ultrasound. Often in human medicine, they'll just have a little ultrasound on a stick, like basically on an IV pole that they'll take right up to bedside and uh, ultrasound the patient um, either in ICU or in the patient's, uh, the patient's room. It's non-stressful, relatively non-painful, highly diagnostic, and it's the standard of care and part of the initial physical examination in human emergency and critical care centers. And they even have these little fast, uh, AFAST and TFAST ultrasounds that are about the size of a, an iPad uh, in the ambulance. And so the ambulance, um, the EMTs are doing um, AFAST and TFAST even before they get to the hospital. So disadvantages are that there is some learning curve and it is user dependent. But if you see a lot of trauma or a lot of cases that have different abdominal and thoracic um, uh, diagnoses, then getting certified or at least getting some training in AFAST and TFAST would be a really good idea. Uh, how many of you have ultrasounds in your practices? So nearly everybody. So, um, you know, so it's, uh, it's equipment that you already have. You don't need to, to spend a lot on, on buying anything new. So it's just a matter of training. So as far as trauma uh, is concerned, um, blunt trauma is generally going to be motor vehicle trauma, and then penetrating is going to be dog bites and projectiles. Uh, projectiles uh, basically are gunshot wounds, and we don't see many of them in Australia. In America, I used to see them all the time, and the most horrendous, um, you know, proximal femoral fractures that are broken up into like 16 pieces from a, um, a, a projectile that's just hit the proximal femur. Um, I had a one dog, a Labrador, come in for a penetrating wound. So the bullet went in one side of the abdomen, came out the other. Labrador came in wagging its tail, eating, drinking, completely happy. And I thought, well, I didn't have CT scan at the time. So I thought I will do an abdominal exploratory because that's the right thing to do just to, you know, to tick that box and then we can wake him up, send him home the next day. And he had free tapeworms in his abdomen from penetration in the intestine. So two, uh, sorry, four penetrating wounds throughout the intestine. Um, and, you know, typical Labrador was still happy eating and drinking. So um, with regard to dog bites, remember that 
uh, dog bites are often the tip of the iceberg. So what you see externally, there's a lot more going on deeply and almost all um, bite, dog bites need to be surgically explored. Even if you just see a couple of punctures superficially, you probably ought to be opening, opening that up, particularly if, if it's overlying the chest wall or the abdominal wall to see if there is a penetrating wound into the abdomen or chest. And then if it has gone into the abdomen particularly, you might consider exploring that because you can have internal trauma, lacerations, perforations of the intestines as well. I'll talk to you about indications for thoracic expiration or thoracotomy, a little bit about antibiotic use and selection, and then a little bit about vacuum-assisted closure. Anybody using vacuum-assisted closure here? Um, so for wound therapy, there's really no nothing better than vac therapy. It's amazing as far as how much granulation tissue um, it stimulates and how uh, you can turn a really horrendous wound into a really nice looking wound. So this was a study that came out in the um, Journal of um, Veterinary Medicine, uh, looking at dog bite wounds in dogs and cats and went back and looked at 196 cases. And intuitively, as you would expect, that mortality significantly increased in bites which involved the thoracic cavity. So that makes sense. Um, the efficacy of prophylactic antibiotics is questionable in veterinary and human medicine. And actually in human medicine, honest, uh, often um, they don't even administer antibiotics, um, certainly not in the post-operative period. And so the question, there's actually a lot of question as to whether with dog bite wounds that you're treating, whether there's any indication for antibiotic therapy. And they haven't shown any benefit and not only that, but you're getting more resistant strains. So that's complete heresy. You know, people think, oh, dog bite wound, got to start them on antibiotics. But in fact, um, there's actually no benefit shown and potentially potentiating um, resistant uh, strains. With any bite wound, you want to do aggressive debridement of anything that even borderline looks like it's necrotic. You want to get rid of it. And note that 11% of dogs that had exploratory thoracotomy died. And that's um, that statistic, note that that's not to say that you shouldn't be exploring these dogs that have thoracic bite wounds, but that these dogs are just sicker and they have more trauma and so they're more likely to die. And also intuitively, smaller dogs had a higher mortality rate. So mortality significantly increased in bites which involved the thoracic cavity and also smaller dogs are the big, um, are the big thing. This was a, another uh, study that looked at thoracic bite trauma in dogs. So this was not just bite wounds in general, this is specifically of the thorax um, and all of these patients had x-rays followed by surgical exploration and thoracotomy. And in only one dog was it decided that thoracotomy was unnecessary. So what that tells you is that when you've got thoracic trauma, you really ought to be opening, opening these dogs up and be prepared that when you open them up, you're going to be in the chest cavity. Okay, so have your ventilator ready. And you don't need a mechanical ventil ventilator in your practice. All you need is a good nurse who can bag them six to ten times a minute. And for the first three years that I was in referral practice, um, after I left the university, we didn't have a ventilator. And my nurses were very happy bagging six to 10 times a minute. And when I bought my first ventilator, they were actually annoyed with me because they thought they were losing control of the anesthetic with the patient. So you're, you can totally do thoracotomy anesthetics with, um, with just somebody on the, on the bag mechanically ventilating. The other benefit of having somebody mechanically ventilating or manually ventilating is that when you're passing sutures in the chest wall, you can tell your anesthetist, okay, stop bagging for a second, pass the needle, and then start bagging straight away. Whereas with a mechanical ventilator, it's another two or three steps to get the ventilator to stop bagging the patient. So what are indications for thoracotomy within the first 24 hours? So this is kind of controversial, but that's the flail or pseudo-flail chest, which I don't honestly believe exists. If you have rib fractures, if you have lung contusions or if you have pneumothorax, you really ought to be exploring these patients within the first 24 hours. And when, uh, what are the indications for immediate thoracotomy? So we're not gonna wait 24 hours. If you see any thoracic organs, that should be a pretty straightforward clue to you that you probably ought to take into surgery. Again, flail chest is controversial. If you have severe trauma with multiple rib fractures and a pneumothorax, one of the big things with that is that you're gonna have sharp ends of the ribs, which can continue to lacerate lung lobes. And so you're gonna have progression of your pneumothorax, which may not be responsive to, um, to management. And then if you see a visible deep trauma like exhibit A up here, 
um, that's something that I certainly would not put in a cage overnight and come back and check on it the next day. All right, so in these um, 45 dogs that had radiographs and thoracic exploratory, 12 out of the 20, 45 dogs required a lung lobectomy. So that's basically a 25%, 27% chance that when you explore this dog that has thoracic bite wounds, that you're going to have to take out a lung lobe. And so you have to be prepared to do that. And you don't necessarily need the stapling equipment, but you have to be prepared to tie off the pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, and then either ligate the bronchus in small dogs or do an oversew of big dogs. And so if you're not prepared to do that, um, you could you find yourself in trouble. Uh, Post-operative wound complications associated um, with 80% mortality. So if they had a wound infection in these dogs after surgery, 80% of those dogs died. And so that tells you you need to be really aggressive with your debridement, okay? Almost all cases of, of exploration of the superficial wound resulted in exposure to the thoracic cavity. So you've got a wound here on the chest wall, big bite wound, and you think, oh, it's just a few penetrating puncture marks. You go to explore it because you're doing the right thing, and you look in there, and all of a sudden you're looking at lung, okay? So that is 44 out of 45 uh, of these patients had exposure of the lung uh, 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 or thoracic cavity when they just opened up the superficial wound. And occult diaphragmatic hernia was diagnosed in three cases that didn't have any abdominal organ displacement. So that means that it's not gonna be apparent on radiographs. So this is a really important study when you're thinking about managing these thoracic bite wounds. Recognizing again that 27% um, of these dogs are gonna require a lung lobectomy when you're exploring the chest. Number two, if they get infected after surgery, almost all of them are gonna die, and so we wanna be really aggressive with our debridement. Almost all cases when you explored the external wound ended up having exposure of the thoracic cavity, and um, diaphragmatic hernia would have easily been missed on x-rays in three out of these 45 patients. So that's one out of 15, so about 7%, something like that. So management recommendations. If you have a thoracic bite wound, the first thing you do is place an occlusive bandage. How many of you have offsite in your practices? So offsite's really handy. So either offsite or what is the betadine one? Um, Iaban. So Iaban is really great because it's going to provide also some protection against bacterial invasion. Um, once you put that occlusive bandage on, you want to address any pneumo or hemothorax that's present by placing a chest tube. Uh, anytime you have thoracic or bite wounds over the thorax, you need to explore these surgically and be prepared that you're gonna find lungs blowing up in your face, okay, actually. So you want to be able to ventilate these patients. Aggressively debride them. Antimicrobial use is controversial and I know that it's really, really hard to contemplate not putting these dogs on antibiotics. I know that to be honest with you, I would probably put them on antibiotics, and I know that most people here would, but its use is controversial. And I think that we really need to seriously consider when we're using antibiotics in our patients, because uh, with the issues with resistance in humans and in animals, you know, it might not be long before the TGA starts regulating the antibiotics that we're allowed to use in our practice. So we can't um, shoot the goose that laid the golden egg, okay? Be, be aware that um, antibiotics may be taken from us, opioids may be taken from us at some point. Just be really ju judicious with what we use. And then closure is controversial. And so if you've got an infected wound, do you want to close over the top of it? Not necessarily. And so that's when, um, uh, if you can't close, then you might use an occlusive bandage with a closed suction drain. Yeah, Zorn. Always use an intraoperative antibiotics. So giving a single dose of IV cefazolin or something like that, totally, totally appropriate. Um, the question is, and you're going, going, going to want to use that every 90 minutes for the duration of the anesthetic. Question is, and it's really not a question, we're all going to do it, um, which is put them on antibiotics for a week or so afterward, but that really is controversial, and I think that we're going to have to, with time, consider whether we really should be giving those antibiotics. And the, the TGA make, may make us reconsider whether we're going to give antibiotics. Um, 
only use primary closure if you can completely excise all of the vitalized tissue. So if you've still got some necrotic tissue in there, don't close over the top of it because that's going to get infected. And then if they get infected, there's an 80% chance that they're going to die. So make sure that we debride them completely. Avoid Penrose drains, and particularly over the chest. Uh, Penrose drain, I mean, I, I, and this is a, a soapbox that I get up on often. We don't have any Penrose drains in our practice. I haven't used a Penrose drain in about 20 years. They are not effective at drainage, and they allow just as many bacteria in as they do out. If you're going to use Penrose drains, make sure that you put a bandage over the top of them because you don't want them open to air where bacteria can climb back up. If you're going to use a drain, you're much, much better off using closed suction drain. Okay, Jackson Pratt drains you can get from Zebra Vet for about 20 bucks. Much, much more effective drainage. Okay, much more effective than Penrose drains. Penrose drains are great for retracting neurovascular bundles when you're in surgery. That is about it. Okay, avoid fluoroquinolones. Why are we avoiding fluoroquinolones alone? Because they are completely useless against anaerobes. Fluoroquinolones work by inhibiting DNA gyrase, and anaerobic bacteria have no DNA gyrase. So the anaerobic bacteria can sit around doing shots of fluoroquinolones, and it's not going to do any good whatsoever. If you're worried about anaerobes, which we are, with a bite wound, you need to use metronidazole, ampicillin, clindamycin, something like that. Okay, so enterfloxacin, ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin, all completely useless against anaerobes. And you should only explore, if you're comfortable with an open thoracotomy, possibly including a lung lobectomy and doing manual ventilation. So remember that 44 out of 45 patients that they explored a superficial wound, 40, so 96% were inside the chest before they knew it. 97% were inside the chest before they knew it. Vacuum-assisted closure. So what is vacuum-assisted closure? That's when you put a, an, uh, an absorbent contact layer, which is going to be either an open cell foam or a laparotomy sponge or something like that, and then you put um, a closed suction drain over the top, and I've got photos of it, and then you put an occlusive iodine drape over the top, and you continually apply 70 to 90 millimeters of mercury negative pressure. What it does is it stimulates mitosis, stimulates angiogenesis, accelerates wound healing, excellent wound drainage, but you still have to debride these first. So an open or a um, vacuum-assisted closure is not going to take the place of good debridement. Um, conforms to any shape of wound, increases concentration of growth factors, and you have decreased bacterial colonization. So this is the um, uh, diagram of a vacuum-assisted closure. So we've got the granulation tissue at the bottom here. Um, we have the um, wound healing coming in from the side, and then you have this closed suction drain that's creating 70 to, 100, 70 to 90 millimeters of mercury of suction, and it's stimulating blood flow, stimulating angiogenesis, and incre increasing uh, wound contraction and granulation. So this is a little drain that's sold by ZebraVet. It's called a Pico drain, and this is very nice for small wounds. Um, and so you've got this little battery-operated um, device that creates closed suction, and then you've got this contact layer that creates this negative pressure on the wound. These cost about 150 bucks a piece, something like that, and you can leave them on for three or four days. And so if you think about, if you have a big, nasty um, open wound that you're going to do wet to dry bandages and you have to change them every 24 hours, it's probably going to pay for itself in the three or four days that you don't have to change the bandage. So it's called a Pico drain, P-I-C-O. And Zebra Vet um, is the company that I that we get them from. I think we pay six hundred dollars for five of them, and they're supposed to be single use. But the fact is that when the battery runs dead, you can pull a little thing out, and it's just a little double A battery, and you can put a new battery in it anyway. So single use, quote unquote. All right, so this is an example of a big, nasty bite wound. Um, 
and this is one that's open in a thoracic cavity and you can't close this because of all the devitalized necrotic tissue. So you do your best to debride it. And then you put um, this open cell, this gray stuff is this open cell sponge that a lot of people get from the, um, the aquarium supply store. So that's the foam that they use with aquarium filters. And then you sterilize it using ethylene oxide. The other thing that works really well is, do you guys have disposable scrub brushes? There's foam on the disposable scrub brushes. That works really well. And it's also impregnated with chlorhexidine because it's a scrub brush. So um, you can use that to pack into your wound. And then that paste on the outside is colostomy paste. Okay, so that paste on the outside, you get a tube of it and it's called stone, uh, I think it's just called stoma paste. And then you put your oxide over the top of it and that's what creates the seal. And so that seal is uh, required to maintain negative pressure. And so three days later, you can see they've pulled it off and look at the difference between the lower left-hand wound and the upper left-hand wound. I'm sorry that the color is so bad. I don't know why the projector um, this time has such color, such poor color reproduction, but you can see that that has um, really cleaned up the wound. The other thing that it does is it sucks the wound edges in together to the point that we could close it. Okay, so VAC is really, really cool. And for people that deal with a lot of wounds, VAC is like a godsend. It's amazing what you can do with it. So this is another patient that's had VAC for a, um, uh, a dorsal bite wound. Okay, pneumothorax, three different types, open, closed, and tension. So um, experimentally, this is in the bad old days of animal research, dogs could tolerate a pneumothorax of 150% of calculated uh, lung volume. So if you had two liter lung volume, you could tolerate five liters of air. Is that 100? No, three liters of air injected into the chest cavity. Um, penetrating pneumothorax should be treated with uh, bandaging and evacuation. So that's a penetrating wound that's not a dog bite wound. So dog bite wound you're going to want to explore. But if it's due to a stick or something like that, probably should explore it anyway. But the main thing that you're going to do is you're going to bandage and evacuate it. Um, you should do thoracocentesis on both sides of the thorax because the mediastinum, um, while it's not always completely intact in dogs, you can definitely have a unilateral pneumothorax. So you definitely want to tap both sides of the chest. And if we have a, a pneumothorax, often we're going to put in two chest tubes, one on either side. Um, and then uh, patients with a high index of suspicion for pneumothorax, you should do a thoracocentesis prior to radiography because these patients are critical. They're sick. And so you don't want to take a patient with a pneumothorax, take it to radiology and stress it out and have it go into respiratory arrest. You want to tap it before you get to um, before you get to x-ray. And Alex has already demonstrated or discussed the method by which we're going to do thoracocentesis. So um, any pneumothorax that has continuous air production require thoraco requiring thoracocentesis more than twice a day needs a chest tube placed. So if you're having to tap these more than twice a wet day, you ought to put in a chest tube. And if you have persistent leakage for more than three or four days, you ought to do a surgical exploration. And surgical exploration results in a more rapid resolution of the pneumothorax and a lower rate of recurrence. So if you're sitting and looking at this dog and there's just air coming back, you know, if honestly, if I had a dog that was had a pneumothorax for two days, I'd be exploring that patient. And that reflects partly my comfort level with thoracic exploratories, but also the fact that I don't want to stare at this dog for the next seven days waiting for the pneumothorax to resolve, which is never going to happen. Um, now, if you have a long-term pneumothorax, remember that there's an issue with re-expansion pulmonary edema. So if you have a long-term pneumothorax or hydrothorax or chylothorax, and then all of a sudden you expand those lungs out by sucking all that fluid or air off, those um, tight junctions between the cells and the alveoli will leak fluid and you'll get re-expansion pulmonary edema, which is refractory to um, any kind of management. You just put them on oxygen, but honestly, they're really a struggle lasts for three or four days. And so those patients, you want to avoid re-expanding them too aggressively. So normally we would be putting 15 centimeters of water on our syringe, but with a re-expansion pulmonary edema potential, we'd probably be using six or seven centimeters of water, remembering that that dog is used to 
having not a lot of lung volume. So we're going to want to expand that gradually. As long as it's, it's oxygenating well, we're going to want to expand, expand it gradually over one to two days. Um, so this is an example of the, I think it's a Myla chest tube. I've never used one. I've seen people use them before and they seem to work quite well. What you do is you put in a, uh, a regular through the needle catheter, so the green one over there, and then you gradually dilate it to a little bit bigger to the point that you can get a guide wire in there, and then you feed the chest tube over the guide wire, and then there's very little risk of damaging lung. So on the left, we have an Argyle catheter. Mm, that looks kind of scary to me. Okay, it's this big, this dagger of a, of a chest tube. And I have seen people, I've seen people perforate lung. I've even seen somebody perforate a heart with it. Okay, so that's not ideal. I much prefer using a Jackson Pratt drain. And so our standard of care at all, our hospital is to kind of semi-surgically place a Jackson Pratt. And the way that we do that is we grasp the end of the Jackson Pratt catheter or drain with a right angle, make an incision in the chest wall, and then tunnel it about three or four spaces, and then just push it through an intercostal space and then feed the Jackson Pratt into the chest cavity. And the benefit of a Jackson Pratt is that you have about that long fenestrations of tiny little fenestrations, so it's virtually impossible for them to get obstructed. And the silicone tubing is also very soft, and so it's not going to kink, and it's not going to hurt as it travels around the ribs. It's also less painful to pull out. These argyle catheters have big, you know, five millimeter fenestrations that can get tissue caught in them. When you pull them out, I've seen actually um, it lacerate lung on the way out and also it grabs onto tissue and muscle and stuff. And so it's really painful. So my preference, this is obviously a surgically placed Jackson Pratt drain, but my preference is even when we're not doing a surgically placed one is to place this percutaneously. And I think that it's, it's a much more gentle, much more effective chest tube. So that's the Jackson Pratt catheter there. Obviously, when you're putting in um, a chest tube using a Jackson Pratt, you don't use that big trocar. So that, that thing is just this huge spike. The only time you use that is when you're going from the inside out, not from the outside in, okay? So with a Jackson Pratt chest tube, there's no risk of lacerating the lung. The fen it's multi, multi fenestrating. There are probably about 500 fenestrations in this thing, so it's not gonna get obstructed. The silicone doesn't uh, kink and the silicone is less, less painful. Don't use the trocar though. Um, we use a white clip that occluder clip from an IV line to prevent inadver inadvertent open pneumothorax. So once you put that chest tube in, you feed a little white clip over the top of it. And then whenever you go to drain it, you open it. And then when you, um, in between drainages, you just snap it shut. And so it reduces the likelihood of an inadvertent pneumothorax. We use a mattress suture around the tube to prevent leakage around the tube. So I've had ca cases, particularly cats, where the skin is so flimsy that you get air leakage along the tube and back into the chest cavity. So you're sucking all this air off and you're getting like five liters of air off a cat. And you think, how is this possible? It's because as you're sucking it off, you're getting um, air traveling along the tube in the sub-Q and then into the chest. So we just put two big mattress sutures around the tube so it's going to occlude with the sub-Q fat and it's gonna keep air from leaking back into the chest cavity. We use a Chinese finger snare, three-way stopcock, and then preferably we wanna bandage the chest, the chest tube in so we're not gonna get bacteria going back in um, around the tube. Yeah, so the grenade you cannot use on the chest because the grenade generates about 50 centimeters of water negative pressure, and you only want about 15 centimeters of water negative pressure. So I have seen human studies where they have used it, but basically they're giving a lung a big hickey. Um, seems a little, yeah, it seems a little bit odd to me that nobody would have checked what the negative pressure is. And the way that you can do it is you can take a tube out of a grenade, put it in some water, compress it, and then open it and see how high up the water runs up the tube. It's about 50 to 60 centimeters of water. All right, um, how many of you, of you have done an autologous blood patch for pneumothorax? Okay, this is a really, really great idea. What you do is if you've got a patient that has a persistent pneumothorax, you put the pneumothorax side down, draw about 10 mils per kilo um, 
of whole blood straight out of the jugular vein and straight into the chest cavity and leave it in there. What they found is that half the dogs, the pneumothorax resolved like that. So it just seals over the pneumothorax. And then another three of the four um, stopped in the subsequent 12 hours. So really clever idea. And we've used it probably three or four cases and it has worked effectively probably 75% of the time. All right, um, with management of traumatic diaphragmatic hernia, note that in this retrospective study, half of the diaphragmatic hernias were missed within, the first, within 30 days of trauma. So half the patients had a diaphragmatic hernia for 30 days and nobody knew it. Some of them might not even have had radiographs. If you've got any kind of trauma, any kind of motor vehicle trauma, any kind of fracture, anything, always do a chest x-ray. Okay, so you don't miss the contusions, pneumothorax, hydrothorax, and diaphragmatic hernia. They found that there was an increased mortality when they were operated within 24 hours. Okay, so generally the guideline is that you want, if they're stable, you want to delay surgery for 24 hours. Indications for urgent surgery would be if you've got basically a GDV in the chest, um, if you have continued hemorrhage, if you have unremitting, abdom unremitting abdominal pain from strangulated bowel, something like that. And with diaphragmatic hernia, you have an increased mortality when you have cardiac arrhythmia simultaneously. So every trauma patient should have a chest X-ray. You should do an ECG as well to look for um, uh, all the different types of arrhythmias that can occur with, um, with chest trauma. So if x-rays are non-diagnostic, then ultrasound is most reliable. And this is not a patient that you want to pre-med and stick in a cage. Okay, you want to watch them very closely because once you pre-med them, remember that all the opiates are respiratory depressants. Um, and so you can cause the patient to go into respiratory arrest just with a pre-med. When you're exploring a patient with a diaphragmatic hernia, you have to do a complete midline abdominal exploratory. And in fact, any kind of abdominal hernia, you go always midline and then pull the abdominal contents back into the abdomen from a midline approach. You never approach over the hernia itself. Um, you want to um, resect strangulated bowel before, and it's not repercussion, it's reperfusion. Um, and you may need to extend your diaphragmatic hernia to reduce the content. So if you get in there, and then the guts have gone up into the chest or the liver has gone up into the chest and swollen because the venous return has been obstructed, sometimes you have to extend your hernia to pull the guts back into the abdomen before you close it. Remember that they do need a chest tube. If you've got a diaphragmatic hernia, you have to put in a chest tube. And if you can't fit everything back into the abdomen because the abdomen is just not used, to, so it's called loss of domain, where you're not, the abdomen is not used to having all those guts in there, then you can do a splenectomy to make more room. Okay, um, and then obviously, yeah, they need a chest tube. Um, so this is a patient radiographs. We can see um, that we've got um, gas loops that are cranial to the diaphragm or the diaphragmatic line. So those are gas loops up there. So that's really diagnostic um, for diaphragmatic hernia, but some of them are not so obvious. And so ultrasound would be best in those situations. This is one that might not be as clear. I think that that stomach sitting in the middle right over the heart. So that would be a clear indication to go to surgery. Um, so clinical management of flail chest. This was another retrospective study. Um, and they suggested as well that most clinical signs are due to pulmonary contusions. And if all you have is flail chest and no other signs of thoracic trauma, you don't need to repair them surgically. If you are exploring them because they've got bite wounds or for whatever reason, go ahead and stabilize them if you're going in anyway. Um, and the biggest reason to stabilize them is to reduce pain because pain can cause, as we all know, decreased ventilation, decreased cough. So if you have decreased cough, you're gonna have more accumulation of secretions in the lungs, more likely to get, um, uh, more likely to get ammonia, ammonia, pneumonia. Um, and you wanna make sure that you treat the pain because pain, again, 
if you resolve or you treat the pain, then they're going to ventilate much better. Um, if you have a flail chest and rib fractures, the first thing that you can do is to bandage them to reduce pain, because if you stop that movement of the ribs going back and forth, they're going to be less painful. If you have sharp ribs that may lacerate the lungs, you should go in there and stabilize them. And that can be either with primary repair of the lungs or of the ribs, which we don't do very often, or you can just get either a rongeur or a rib cutter and just cut off the sharp edges. Um, the need, so if they're decomp decompensating with flail chest, you need to mechanically ventilate them. And the need for me mechanical ventilation is a poor prognostic indicator. That makes sense. If one is so sick and decompensating so much, you have to put them on a ventilator, that patient's not going to do as well. Um, most patients with rib fractures have other significant thoracic trauma, and th significant tra thoracic trauma might include pneumothorax, hydrothorax, diaphragmatic hernia, um, traumatic myocarditis, et cetera. And in cats with flail chest, pleural effusion or diaphragmatic hernia have a poor prognosis. So this is a patient with a flail chest, and what, what they've done is just gone in and sutured using heavy gauge, probably O-nylon or something like that, and they're just suturing the ribs together to provide an internal splint for stabilization. So this was a retrospective study of pulmonary contusions secondary to motor vehicle trauma. And um, pulmonary contusions is not a contraindication for fluid administration. So pulmonary contusions, you're not going to exacerbate them by giving them adequate hydration. So obviously with trauma, the first thing you want to do is give them adequate fluids. Just because they have a contusion doesn't mean you shouldn't give them fluids. Pneumonia is not common, and so you don't need to give antibiotics to patients that have pulmonary contusions. So you should be thinking every, you know, every way you can how you can reduce your antibiotic use. Corticosteroids are contraindicated, and for more severe con uh, contusions, um, they often need longer hospitalization, and sometimes they need oxygen. And if you need a ventilator, mortality is much higher, so that makes sense. Um, and then, Managing myocardial contusions and arrhythmias, you want oxygen therapy, you want fluid therapy, give blood transfusion if it's necessary, correct any electrolyte abnormalities, and the key thing is pain control. Okay, so I'll skip that. Um, so this is one of my favorite slides. He's complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath, cramps, and dizziness. Do you sell your plugs? All right, so this is a little mini ultrasound that this ambulance driver has um, to uh, do an AFAST and a TFAST right in the, um, uh, right in the ambulance. Um, so this is a patient that we're creating thoracic trauma. Um, and so remember that when we are creating thoracic trauma with surgery, we want to consider all those, con uh, those issues as well, pain control, oxygenation, make sure that we stabilize the tissues so they're not going to be in pain. Um, so I'll skip this. Um, so just very briefly, um, some of you were able to see um, the 3D video that we had going on in the back. We really are pushing our minimally invasive surgery, and this is kind of cool. When you're suturing with conventional, um, with conventional laparoscopy, Basically, if you imagine putting your wrists in casts, okay, so let's put our wrist in casts, get a box, stick your arm through holes in the box, and then try to juggle. That's basically what laparoscopic surgery is like. You're just moving your, so if you want to move to the right, you have to move your elbow to the left, et cetera. So it's really challenging. And there's some great surgeons that can do minimally invasive surgery laparoscopically, but um, it is a struggle. So in human surgery, what they've done is they've created this thing called a Da Vinci surgical robot. And with Da Vinci robot, um, it's a $3 million machine and it costs between six dollars and $10,000 every time you plug it in, all right? And what you have is this little game controller and you have this praying mantis looking thing that's hanging over the patient. And so you can do virtually anything inside a patient using this robot. And I really want one, but they're not on eBay yet. <laughs> so these are the little robotic graspers and you can see how fine and delicate 
um, the surgery that they can do is. So I think this is just so amazing that somebody's come up with this idea and think, yeah, we're actually going to pull this off. The other cool thing that you can do is you can load an MRI. Say you're doing a prostatectomy. You can load the MRI into the da Vinci and then circle areas that are out of bounds so where nerves are and stuff, and the robot will not let you go there. Okay? So incredible um, dexterity. So uh, a human surgeon has come up with this device, which is called Flexdex, which is a little single-use disposable item, which costs in America $500. In Australia, it's about $1,400. And so what it does is it converts your wrist movements into, um, into movements of this little arm at the end, and they're even doing in humans ureteral resection and anastomosis with this thing. So, um, and you can see how delicate the, the procedure is. So we have, um, now we have the flex desk, deck system in our hospital and every day we're just pushing the boundaries with what we can do with it. Um, so this is an example of uh, gastropexy that we're doing um, with, um, so that's the flex dex on the right hand side. And that's me in the corner. We've got our 3D glasses on as well. And it's a little bit tedious um, when you first get used to it. The first gastropexy took me about an hour and 20 minutes, um, but we are getting faster and faster each time we use it. And so we still are open. Um, if there are patients that you know, any larger giant breed dog, um, you can justify doing a gastropexy on them prophylactically because it's going to save money in the long time, not to, long term, not to mention the fact that you're going to reduce mortality. And so we're still doing them for about $2,500. And at the same time, we're happy to spay or neuter them if you'd like us to. So any large deep chested dog, particularly like Great Danes, have a 45% chance of having a GDV at some time in their life. So if you have any clients that are particularly motivated and have a larger deep chested do dog that might be interested, um, we're happy to do them. And that $2,500, we're doing it at a loss, but it's really cool. And so that's why I'm happy to um, to absorb that. Um, we also encourage everybody to come and spend a day with us at Southpaws. Um, I know some of you have already done that. Um, and you know, you'll know, you come in, you'll see six or eight surgeries, probably eight or 10 CT scans, some radiation therapy. It's a really fun place to hang out. So um, this is uh, the pericardectomy that Alex showed you before. Um, and are you guys all familiar with our YouTube channel? You should be by now. If you're not, get out your phone. Check out your iPhone right now. Point it at the screen. Okay, everybody, come on, phones. If you're not on our YouTube channel, get your phones out, point it at the screen. Put it on camera and point it at the screen and see what happens. Yeah. You're, you're obviously um, removing all of the loose tissue and so forth. Do you flush? Yeah, you flush the hell out of it. You flush the hell out of it? Yeah. Normal yeah. saline. Normal saline. Yeah. Drain it all. Yeah. 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 So did you guys know your phones could do that? Ah, too bad. Get an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So... Um, don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications so that when you're in consult and you're bored, um, you'll get a little ding saying that we're doing another surgery live stream, just like this lecture was live streamed. And, um, and so um, you can log on. I'm usually wearing a headset so I can talk to you while I'm doing the surgery. You can post questions. Um, so uh, how many of you have seen a live stream surgery, Southwest? So a few of you. It's kind of fun. We have like a group of people like all over the world from Bosnia and Bulgaria and Brazil India that all log on at the same time. We have a little chat, tell a few dad jokes, make fun of my residents. Um, so um, really encourage you to do that. Are there any questions um, at this point? Any questions about anything? Yes. Oh, that little um, back, is it this pico? Pico drain, yep. How many different sizes or is it the one set size? It's, the pico drain is one size. You can buy all kinds of different vac systems. Um, you, we actually create our own vac system um, using wall suction or a standard suction unit. And the way that you, it's kind of tricky, the way that you adjust the suction is that you have a three-way stopcock. So you have your patient going here, 
you have the suction unit going here, and then you have a tube going and hanging in a bucket of water, st sterile saline, and then you adjust the suction until the water comes up 70 centimeters, and then you know that you're 70 to 80 centimeters of water, you know that you're applying the right amount of suction to your patient. Uh, not terribly, but they have to be hospitalized and they have to be monitored 24 hours a day. Most yeah. of the patients at home will come in three different sizes, which you can order. So there's quite the peak of a pump one. And we do them in like um, skin grafts and big wounds that we want to close. And we send them home with them, not only to have to check that they're flat for any of these. And do they adhere well to the skin? That's why you use the eye band. They can be really. So, those of you that are watching the live stream, thank you very much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe and make sure that you turn on notifications. Anyway, we'll see you again soon.